Thank you, Jackie, for that excellent and very, very thoughtful contribution. I, I, I have got a number of people with their hands up. Before I go to the list of people with their hands up, I'm going to be cheeky and I'm going to ask John Dunn from the All Grief, Truth and Justice campaign if he would like to say a few words to the meeting. Well, that's a surprise, Ed. I weren't expecting that. But uh, one thing I'd, I'd like to say is about the Labour Party. In many areas of the North now, we're in a Scotland situation. That uh, the betrayals over years uh, by Labour, and Chris mentioned our strike in, in 84, 85, people have never forgiven Labour for that. And all we've had in, uh, in respect to uh, Labour over years is they've given us the Millie Bands, the Caroline Flints, the Natasha Engels in my old constituency. And, and I think now that in terms of winning a parliamentary majority, it's over. They will never win back those what they call the red wall seats in any in any in any number, uh, and that's primarily, as I say, because of years from from the 1960s betrayal by by Labour. And uh, I've been in Labour Party 49 years. I've cancelled my direct debit. I took it out. Uh, at the end of last year for, for one year. And I think it's an energy trap. I can understand that where people have got a good constituency uh, and there are a lot of like-minded comrades about them, but in a lot of my areas, the former mining areas, the Labour Party's never really existed for 30 years. You know, councillors are made up by husband and wife and sons and daughters dynasties, the meetings, uh, there's never been any growth in, in, uh, in any sort of membership figures in, in these areas and they're totally cut off from, uh, from the cities and from where you might have a vibrant Labour Party. So one, I don't think that you can ever win back or at least in the short term or even medium term you'll ever win back these these sort of places and I actually think that uh, in some of the areas some of, and I'm talking particularly about ex mining areas that it's a liability having a Labour Party tag you know that it's, it's hated there are people who bought two bottles of champagne one to celebrate Margaret Thatcher's death and obviously they've gone and the second one is to celebrate Neil Kinnock's death and they wait, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're waiting for that. And that is the reality. And I think you can't get away from that in terms of talking about whether you're in the party or out. My own constituency, I'll give you an example of how the old tone of the party has changed. Uh, I'm in Calder Valley, uh, obviously for crimes I've you know, committed in a previous life. But... Uh, they recently set up a Facebook page and I, I just posted, we've got the All Grieve Rally that's a virtual rally this year, next week. And I actually posted a link to that, or I tried to, and I referred to the police as Thatcher's Thugs in Blue, uh, attacking us, uh, and I, the, the bit I always say, we're still here, but Thatcher's dead, yay. And they refused to, to post it. This is a left-wing, supposedly, led constituency. Uh, 
they refused to post it on the grounds that referring to the police in 1984 as Thatcher's thugs in blue was offensive and that celebrating Thatcher's death would prevent people from joining the Labour Party of the sort of calibre that we wanted. And I think you have to accept that the whole tone of the party membership has changed. A lot of the people, a lot of the hundreds of thousands who supported Corbyn actually voted for Starmer. You know, we were elected with a similar majority to what Corbyn got the first time round. And I don't think that after 49 years and at, at, at my age, I want to spend much time in an energy trap that one, will take me nowhere, but two in certain areas will, will be a liability. I got suspended in 16 purely for standing up to Owen Smith when he tried to hijack the Orgreave campaign. I got reinstated, I don't know why, because I was never told why I was out, but now all that is building a pace. And if you want to stay, by all means stay. But I think the way forward, the sort of things that Chris is talking about, building in communities because that's what a lot of us have always done we we fought inside our communities we fought against library closures by labor councils we fought against cuts we've tried to hold the fabric of our societies together and we're seeing that the, the resistance now is taking place on the streets it's not people sat in zoom labor party meetings passing resolutions that are going to get ignored and so by all means if you want to stay and fight stay and fight but i need telling how that fight takes shape and what we do and where it will lead us and and i cannot reiterate that enough in many of the constituencies that we lost to the tories in the last election being a labor party member is a liability Okay, thank you, John. Um, I'm now going to call Ray G into the discussion. You've had your hand up a long time, Ray. Ray, are you there? Um, well, if if Ray has Ray left the meeting, <laughs> no. uh, all, all right. Well, while we're waiting for Ray to appear, I'm going to call Graham Graham Bash in instead. Thank you, comrade. Can you hear me? Personally, I yeah, I'd like to congratulate Roger on what is actually an excellent document, and all of the speakers because actually. I thought they all made a number of really important points. Now, let me just say, <laughs> I agree with Roger's first point and the last point. is the bit in the middle that I want to take some issue with. Now, you're absolutely right, Roger. We are on the brink. This is not 1997. This is the beginning of what could be a revolutionary period. The depth of the crisis the economic crisis facing Britain and the world, with only, we are only beginning. This is only the beginning of it. And it's conditions that will determine everything. And in the next, next months and years, we could be facing events of massive, massive proportions. And I also agree with your last point, essentially, I is paraphrasing you, but at the moment, the don't to say don't go down the blind alley of trying to find an electoral alternative to Labour. Now that I also agree with. But it's just some of the points you made in the middle that I want to take issue with. As Lenin said, our task is always to tell the truth to our movement. And I think that you understate the scale of the problem in three ways. One, in terms of what the Labour Party has always been. 
Now, I've written a document 15 years ago about this, nowhere near as detailed or in many ways as good as you. But the critical thing is that the historic conquest that the, the creation of the Labour Party represented was always a deformed conquest. Compare the Labour Party with obviously the Russian Social Democratic Party or, or, or even the German uh, Social Democratic Party. This was a party that for the first 20 years had no individual membership, had no socialist programme at all. And I do agree with Tina's point that even Clause 4, and we defend it to the death, was a very diluted form of socialism. Uh, it was a creation of the webs, the product of the class uh, pressures, the international class pressures from the Russian Revolution. But to say that the Labour Party has been socialist for 75 years ignores the fact that throughout the majority of its history, it has been under the control of the right wing of the parliamentary Labour Party and the trade union bureaucracy. The Labour Party was deformed because it always separated parliamentary politics, politics from trade unionism. And that was the core of Labourism. It's always been a Labourist party. Now, the second thing that I think which you underestimate is the scale of the defeat within Labour that we're now suffering. I think there's every danger that you're right to say that there is no base for Starmerism because of the depth of the crisis. But to think that this is just a temporary phenomenon, I think is incredibly hopeful. We gave them the fright of their lives with Corbyn. And I think that they will change everything in the party to try and batten down the hatches and make sure that we never get our hands anywhere near power. And the third thing, um, I think, is to, we, you, I think a number of comrades, actually understate the scale, the depth of the defeat that our movement suffered after the miners' strike. And Tina is right to talk about the errors of Jeremy and John, without a doubt, but I think they've got a, a material base, because when they didn't attack the power of the Parliamentary Labour Party, to their, uh, uh, to their discredit and to, uh, um, with the outcome which we've seen, when they allow the Labour Party bureaucrats to be within the party headquarters attacking the party, when they, allow, when they threw Chris Williamson, Jackie, Tony and the rest under a bus, and when they allowed the momentum as a grassroots movement to be bureaucratised top down, when they allowed that to happen, it was partly their error, but the root of it was the problem that there wasn't a counter pressure from below. And why wasn't there a counter pressure from below? Because the movement had suffered such defeat in the last 30 years, despite the, up, the upsurge of membership of half a million. Now that could have been the beginnings of a fight back. And the criticism I have of Jeremy and John and these people is that they failed to develop that into what could have been a mass mobilization from below. But in conditions in which the movement, the trade union movement had suffered a real defeat. Now this, I'd just like to finish with this point. In or out of the Labour Party, well, of course, inside the Labour Party, but the point of being inside the Labour Party isn't just the fight in the wards, in the GCs, etc. It is to give political representation to the resistance that is happening from below. And our task primarily is to connect with that movement that is developing in front of our eyes. Within the trade unions, yes, in Black Lives Matter, yes. But the central thrust of what we have to do is to develop the resistance. Because in the beginning is the class struggle. And if there isn't class struggle, then the Labour Party is totally a pointless exercise. It is to give representation to that movement. So that's where I think we're at. I'm, I'm not interested uh, in looking for electoral alternatives. I've been around for 50 years in the party, and I've seen, ton, I've seen dozens of these electoral alternatives getting two or 300 votes. Life's may be too short for some to spend all your time in the party, but to go down that dead end, please comrades, don't even consider it. And just the point finally that Jackie made, I'm not a
out uh, because of the um, because of the rules of the party to say that I am under investigation. I'm not allowed to say it, but I am. But if I were uh, to be under investigation, I would be supremely relaxed about it because we've got a we've got a fight, uh, a class struggle to what to build from the roots to give it political expression in the party. But let's get it that way round. So congratulations to the speakers and congratulations to Roger for an excellent document. Thank you, Graham. Um, I'm now going to call um, David Hempson in. Dave, perhaps you can just introduce yourself a little bit too, Dave. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, hello to everyone and uh, comrade greetings from uh, the Centre of uh, Money and the Military, uh, DC, Washington, DC. I'm just outside, actually, in a in a in a very uh, quiet place. But uh, the, the last few weeks have been very unquiet. And I just want to pass on some points which may reflect something that, uh, something of the debate, and particularly some of the points about that uh, Graham has mentioned, particularly in relation to the electoral side. What we've seen here in the last three weeks is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, at times, I've got tears in my eyes when I, when I look at it, and you see phenomenally able black youth coming into leadership, not as a black movement alone, but actually uniting black and white without even mentioning the fact of being able to pull hundreds, thousands, and even tens of thousands into the streets and to be able to polarize the discussion with the National Guard facing rubber bullets and then also to be able to exercise within the movement a discipline to say, guys, hang in there, please keep discipline and to be able to follow through so that we've had tremendous success and something like 75% approval throughout society now, you know, for Black Lives Matter and for the, for the, you know, the, whole, the whole movement. Now, how does this affect the debate? I've been on the streets and discussing with the, with the youth um, a question which is raised from South Africa, because although I have been a member of the Hackney Labour Party in the past, actually, you know, my roots are actually in Durban. And, uh, you know, their question from Black South Africa is, why the hell have you not got rid of Trump? And the reason is, and I've raised this with uh, youth, is that in the end, despite having to drink poison, they're going to have to vote for the Democratic Party. They'll get Trump out through the slogan, Remember November. I couldn't believe it, but there it is remember November, and I'll put in one of the weakest candidates the United States has ever seen you know, into power as, as, as president. Now, how does this reflect on, on our discussion? I think we need to realize that there's a revolution taking place. It's not a matter of how do we prepare for the socialist revolution. There's a revolution in progress, and it's edging forward, and it's rushing forward, and at the same time, it's revolutionary with the most marvelous uh, militants. At the same time, there are these terrible contradictions because at the end on the electoral plane, people are still going to have to vote for some of the most unworthy candidates any Democrat, quite apart from a socialist, would ever have to put forward. Now, how do we face up to this? There's a generational divide. I'm 75. It's something like two or three generations from the people I'm talking to. And yet that's the spirit of Soweto. That's the spirit of Tiananmen Square. Those are the fighters that we want to get through and we want to actually have fighting with us and fight with them. Now, we face this problem which Graham has raised. Where does this move? And eventually things will have to move to the electoral plane because this is a democratic society. This is how unusually still there are constitutional issues of, of that order. It's a democratic transformation in a sense. And we're forced to look the, through all of this with that lens. And that's why I do feel that we can't, these different groups, sometimes it's been a very rich debate, sometimes quite 
um, I wouldn't say tearful, but actually, you know, facing some rather unpleasant truths and speaking truthfully about them. But how do we pull together ourselves and the left and some of the marvelous work that's been done in the past and in the present so that we actually transform society? And I do think that we need to look at what Roger said, produce a fighting program which is in and out of the Labour Party, but actually works to bring all those contradictions into the Labour Party. I don't know what happened in Bristol, but I mean, there was, I think, a Labour Council there. I don't know what happens with all the remnants and all the excretions of colonialism and racism, which still have to be removed in society. But we are in the process of a political and a cultural revolution. And we need to get our hands on board. We need to get our selves committed to this and to be able to pull all those ideas together because that's our strategic way in which we've got to work as Marxists and as socialists. Let me stop there. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much, David. The next person to speak is Trish O'Hara. Oh, hey, hi. Um, fantastic, Roger. Fantastic launch and brilliant speakers as to accompany your brilliant pamphlet, which made me take notes. I don't think I ever took notes uh, um, from a pamphlet before. <laughs> so obviously it has got me really thinking. I've been really thinking about the things you've all said. And you know, the fact that it's, um, you know, the, the magazine and everything uh, that uh, Wynne uh, has put forward, which is on the brink. I think we've brinked, haven't we? And I think Roger and I have said this, and I think David's just said that. I don't think we need to look for for where it's going. I think it's gone. I think Labour's chasing the tail of what's happening now in a way that for a start, we've had a lot of speakers and you've all been brilliant, eloquent, fantastically interesting and engaging, even though I don't feel very well, I've been absolutely gripped. The truth is none of you have mentioned the environment. None of you have talked about probably the very biggest picture, which is the environment. Now we know we have spoken about Black Lives Matter, which is a fantastic movement, but I think in my experience, and it's not very broad my experience, my experience is that, you know, I joined the Labour Party because of Corbyn, because I saw socialism. I've been in socialist worker and things like that. Labour Party was never, it was always a bit turgid for me in that sense. But I, heard, I saw socialism and a lot of people much younger and much, you know, also inexperienced have joined the Labour Party or did join the Labour Party because of a movement, not because because they wanted it all to come to a grinding halt. And I see that the, the PLP is off on its own run. And I, I kind of believed, like many people, that everyone in Labour was a Labour person. It, it's hilarious to think that because I'm now amongst people in my CLP who are clearly not even just Liberal. They're, they're out and out Tories, but they're in the Labour Party. And, and I, that's a bloody shock when you join the Labour Party. I think that's a real shock that you think everyone on the Labour Party is going to be left to centre. And that's there's not even, it's, we're in the minority, I'd say, the left of centre. It seems everyone's quite liberal at the very least, and liberals are a pain in the ass. All this kind of idea that these young people who perhaps voted for, for Corbyn are maybe voting for Starmer isn't because they necessarily know what Starmer represents. I think they think he's just the Labour Party and they join the Labour Party because the Labour Party is going to do good things. Um, the fact is, they don't know. They don't know that Starmer is just... Blair too and they don't really know much about Blair what they know about is veganism environmentalism changing the, the, their lives and their families lives and changing their opportunity particularly if they're black and male particularly in America right now and in the UK the fact is this movements are happening and I think we are we're pontificating when we should be helping that movement politics become, we need to help the left join itself, join itself up, even though certainly um, Extinction Rebellion will have in some cases been politically lost and made some very strange decisions. The fact is it's a lot of wonderful people who want change. I think we need to work with them. We need to be attracting how we, how do we branch out to work somehow with people who were already moving. 
And Black Lives Matter are moving. They ain't waiting for Labour Party to talk about whether Starmer's a liberal twat or not. We all know in the Labour Party he is. Even the bloody ones who voted for them probably know he is. The fact is they don't really want change. If you didn't vote for Corbyn in this country, you didn't want change. That's the truth. And the people who want change are by and large young, often militant about things that we might not care about, about their sexuality, about their, what they choose to eat, or their right, animal rights, planetary changes and i don't think we're talking about those things at all so any young people who've joined the labor party will come to one meeting and then walk off and i think we've got to do something different thank you that was all i wanted to say so, th thank you very much trish uh, the next person i'd like to call is themos dimitriou would you like to introduce yourself briefly themos as well <coughs> Well, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Femos Dimitriou from Cyprus. I have been working, uh, started uh, as, a as a member of the Socialist Party of Cyprus. I was expelled back in, the, in 1980. Ever since we are working as, uh, as a, a group called the Left Wing, because we were the Left Wing of the Socialist Party. We, are still, we still bear that name and we are working on all sorts of ways. Anyway, uh, it was um, uh, a tremendous uh, evening tonight. Uh, this, uh, the speeches were very informative and very uh, and really hitting the, the problems that we have to face. And I think we should, we should really face those things. Uh, I want to say, of course, that uh, we're not uh, working in the UK now. Uh, I'm the last person to to express a firm of pin, opinion on, on what should be done about the Labour Party, but uh, I would like to say my impression of what uh, what to, what we should do and uh, try to to give some uh, points of view that might be discussed uh, uh, here. To start with, I would uh, say that um, I agree that um, speaking about working in the Labour Party or outside the Labour Party has been uh, a discussion that ever since I remember in my political life. And uh, I was one of those who were uh, firmly on the side of working inside the Labour Party. It, it, the question seems uh, rather irrelevant to me now and irrelevant in the sense that uh, we need to uh, to realize what our work is and our and i shall uh, uh, i shall uh, agree with uh, david Hemsworth that uh, the main thing is that the revolution is happening now under our noses and and this should be our guiding principle and that's where we should we should really focus and not get bogged down in what was the Labour Party in the previous years, how it worked, how it went forward, what, what is going on. This is not the, the main issue. The main issue is what do we do with this changing situation now? And uh, Black Lives Matter is an important movement, a very important movement. The climate movement is a very important movement, but they are not the issue. I mean, I, they play the same role as the Occupy movement played in the previous period. And uh, there we had specific results that had political implications, had political results. And the results in Greece, for example, was the, the six months of the series uh, uh, of the series uh, uh, rule in Greece. And that was important. That defeat, that uh, uh, desertion by the series of leadership of the movement meant that the movement worldwide had a hit. And Corbyn, Corbyn's fall now, it, it's an even greater hit for the, uh, for the movement. And we should, should take this into account. But uh, having said that, I, I would tend, tend to, ag to agree with uh, with David uh, Hemson, uh, that uh, 
that uh, to, to try to find the electoral alternatives for the Labour Party would be pointless, completely pointless. And uh, this is, uh, if we are talking about revolution that is happening, we are not talking about building a party that will take 50 years to develop and win the parliamentary elections. That's not the point. So my, my approach would be that we should, uh, we should really see how we organize. And getting, uh, starting from what I think went wrong with Jeremy Corbyn. Of course, Corbyn was not, uh, was not the man to, to lead uh, 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 the Socialist Labour Party because he, he was left alone there. Everyone else was outside, was doing, saying whatever they wanted to say, but he was alone and he didn't, he didn't know any other way of organizing except the limited grassroots work that he was doing in his constituency, meeting the people, doing uh, beautiful work everywhere, but not organizational revolutionary work. And that's, that's something that uh, we should realize. And the left there failed Corbyn, I think. The left in the Labour Party failed Corbyn in the sense that they didn't formulate the policies that uh, uh, that could to make him take really real control of the party. Maybe they couldn't do it. I'm not saying that they could, but certainly, um, to my uh, to my uh, uh, eyes, looking from outside and and for, from a distance, uh, there, there was no there was no determined attempt. Uh, to change the party. And, uh, here I agree with uh, that he should have done what Blair had done and, uh, and, he didn't, and he didn't do it. I mean, this is the sort of thing that we should be discussed. So, to not to say, uh, not to keep on on this, I, I would think that our work should be to build uh, grassroots work, build, build people, people's power to, to, uh, uh, to, have, to, to have effect. That's one thing. The other thing is that we should uh, really try to, to formulate the, the theory of the movement. Try, try, try to formulate uh, uh, what we can do and, and try to discuss uh, with, the, uh, with the rest of the left what is going on and, and have a real discussion, honest discussion. A discussion that will not uh, will not result in just uh, throwing stones at each other because we have been very good doing that for a long time and we uh, and it's about time we stopped. Yes, we have differences. Yes, we work each one of the, the way we feel that we should work, but for God's sake, we should, uh, we should manage uh, to find ways to work together, act together and go forward. For me, I would, uh, I would stay firmly in the Labour Party, but not lying low and trying to, uh, to weather the storm and go further down. Stay there, build, fight openly, clearly, speak to the people, make the, the, build the movement. That's what, uh, what, uh, what I would do. And uh, just to give you the ex an example of what we are doing in Cyprus, after a lot, of, a lot of time is uh, living in the wilderness. For the last uh, five years, we are uh, we are having what we call uh, uh, the uh, the left and the Cyprus problem, in which it's a conference in which we manage to bring each and every party and organization of, Cy of the left of Cyprus together, and they speak together. They exchange views, and, uh, and this is, includes uh, all the mainstream parties, Turkish Cypriot and Greek Cypriots, all the organizations, uh, uh, anarchists, Trotskyists, uh, uh, small groups, uh, sects. They come there, they speak, and they listen to each other. Now, what will come of that, we don't know. But it's, it's, it's an, open, an opening for a dialogue that I think we should really try. Thank you very much. Thank you, Themos. Um, on the list of speakers that people who've got their hands up, 
I've got Ray G who has reappeared in the meeting, Felicity and John Ryman. I'm hoping that if those three comrades um, limit their remarks to about five minutes and then we'll invite Roger Silverman to say a few words at the end, um, would that be acceptable to the meeting that we then draw, we aim to draw the meeting to a conclusion round about nine o'clock? Is that okay? Please indicate if, if anyone's very unhappy about that, let them message me and I'll try and get you in to speak um, if there's a little bit of time. But apart from that, that's the plan. So it's Ray G. Hi, thank you. There's so many, many things I could say. It's been a really interesting discussion and thank you very much for organising it. Um, just the first point, somebody mentioned um, about keeping all your eggs in one basket and it's true, in some areas the Labour Party is completely bankrupt uh, and as also in some areas there's, there's almost no point in stopping it from being bankrupt. Um, we've actually got this in one borough. In my borough in London, um, I am the chair of one party um, the neighbouring party is completely in the hands of one of the worst MPs, her family, and the kind of mafia that she operates through that in Walthamstow. Um, so I'm not going to advise people to spend all their time banging their heads against people in, in, in fixed meetings where the membership secretary isn't given a membership list and all this nonsense. There's better things to do. Somebody clever once said, um, sorry, before I say that, there's, and, and there's this thing about if you've got a Labour Party card in your pocket, it doesn't mean that you can't take part in the picket line. It doesn't mean that you can't get involved in, in campaigning in community or Black Lives Matter or the environmental movement. It just means you've got a Labour Party card in your pocket. Sometimes, in some areas, it might be fruitful to take part in the Labour Party. Sometimes it isn't. Um, interestingly, um, somebody once said, of course, you know, what you need is a party. If a party is a fish, what you need is a river. Um, I think it was Mao. I'm not, I'm not in the habit of quoting Mao, I don't think, but, so, but in this particular case, it's true because, you know, what we need to build is the movement. We need to build a movement of working class resistance in which any kind of party can then play its part. Um, and there's no point spending your life in a committee room discussing subsection three of the, of the clauses when actually you could be out there building movement of working class resistance against what's going to be in the next five years, the biggest attack to working class people you've probably seen for many, many decades. Um, and so, yeah, um, my, my history is, you know, people are expressing such disappointment about the Labour Party as if, and I sometimes think, well, how can you be disappointed? I joined the Labour Party in 1974. I was a very precocious 15 year old and I had to be persuaded to join the Labour Party because I thought then as a 15 year old that it was a sellout. But I knew in 1974 the Labour Party was bankrupt. Chris obviously joined two years after me, he's a Johnny come lately. Um, you know, didn't, he wasn't, didn't have my advanced theoretical level. Um, but I didn't join the Labour Party because I thought it could achieve socialism. I was convinced all along it would never achieve socialism. The Labour Party was an obstacle which we had to overcome in the struggle to build socialism. And it's the easiest thing in the world, of course, to, uh, to, to give a litany of, 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 of Labour Party betrayals in the way that Chris did. I mean, Chris, obviously, he stayed in the Labour Party through Blair and the Iraq war, but now apparently um, it's the time to leave and build another, well, I, I'm not quite sure what the difference is. If you didn't leave in, in 2001, 2003, why are you getting so animated about leaving now? I'm not really sure why that's the case. Um, but I didn't believe the Corbyn promise, that the whole Corbyn thing was a fantastic historical accident. None of us even believed it would happen. It was kind of a little bonus. It was, it was something else we did as a kind of a, you know, something useful, which we didn't expect, and dragged us all into the party, but there was no preparation for it. The left didn't build slowly and gradually to build for this, uh, this, this, this movement. And so you elected a leader of a party that was still completely in the hands, at root and branch of, of his opponents. And he didn't have, the, he was too isolated, he didn't have the strength. And to be honest, he didn't really have the character either. I mean, he didn't have the, his own politics were, so not, were not robust enough to actually defend. He thought that the Labour Party would sort of play by the rules. He thought you could unite people. He thought you could achieve party unity with a bunch of vipers. Um, which I, but I've known they'd been, I've, 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 I've known they were vipers since, since I was a schoolboy. And so the, 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 what they do now is not remotely surprising. And anybody who claims to be surprised just hasn't been paying attention. Um, 
So I don't. I didn't believe the whole Corbyn promise. I didn't join the Labour Party. I didn't. I didn't support Corbyn because I thought he was going to vote socialism in. I didn't think for one second he would do that. And if he ever did win, if he got the famous two thousand five hundred votes and actually won, he'd be brought down in a second by the PLP. And if he wasn't brought down by the PLP, he'd be brought down by the international banking system. And eventually, he'd be brought down by the police. And if he if he didn't give in, he'd be in a basement somewhere having his fingernails pulled out. Let's be clear here: capitalism is not going to give his. He's not going to give his uh, give give their power away because we win an election. This is nonsense. So why am I in the Labour Party? I'm in the Labour Party not because I agree it's going to be the, the way to achieve socialism, but because um, we have to win the people who look to it away from it into the way to achieve socialism. You know, because we're not in it because Labour Party because we think it's a good thing. It's not like this. It's not like you know. It's not, it's not like a pub or a favourite restaurant that we like popping into. We're in it because people who go to it can be won over to the ideas of socialism. And, and that's why if they're there, why should we not be? Now, I understand entirely, and I, I, John Dunn's points were great. I mean, in some parts, I think, in the North, the Labour Party is regarded as so appalling that it's probably effectively counterproductive, at the moment at least, to organise around that banner. But that's fine. Um, Moving very quickly on, I think we have yeah, to see what are the, quickly, please, right. very quickly, yeah. last, last sentence. Um, I'm a Marxist. I've always been a Marxist. I joined, I was a Marxist when I joined the Labour Party 40 years ago. Um, and on that basis, we have to look at what, what's the economics of this? What, what, is, is there the economic basis for Keir Starmer to go back to Blairism? And I don't think there is. Well, he's got a choice. Given the economy, as, as Roger outlined, he can either go try and give a kind of a, a radical um, objection to austerity or he can completely join the right and become an openly pro-capitalist party which i suspect he might try and do whether he gets away with it or not is, is, is up for contention but if he does that don't you see if he does go to the right if he does attempt to attack working class people if he does dump all of our policies that in itself will be now i'm all for i'm all for one day marching out of the labor party you know but i'm not i'm not for dribbling out of it i'm for marching out of it um, I dribbled out before. I was exhausted in, 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 the, in the late 80s. Um, you know, Kinnock was too much for me, let alone Blair. Um, but I was wrong to do that, and I, and I, was, and I should have stayed. Uh, and a lot of socialists who left around that time, nudge, nudge, were also wrong to do it at that time. And I think the idea is now we should, um, we need to, we need to be there inside the party, preparing ourselves for these developments and winning people over to the idea of social. If it turns out that the right will not go, you know, there are people in my Labour Party who I would I relish the point of actually confronting on the streets. I don't want to be in the same Labour Party as them. There are some of them I would quite happily wreak personal violence upon. Um, but, you know, we're in the same party as them. If, if, we, if, they, if they don't leave, if there's no split, then okay, we may, we, we may have to split, but that'll be on the basis of a couple of unions splitting. It would be a couple of, of leading parliamentarians splitting. It would be the question of hundreds of thousands of people splitting, or at least tens of thousands splitting, not people going off in a huff um, and, and, and getting all miserable about it. That's not, that's not how it's gonna work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ray. Um, I'm glad you got the opportunity to come into the meeting. The next speaker is Felicity. Apologies, um, and everyone's saying their history. I joined the Labour Party in 1974 as well, and was booted out as one of the Labour councillors in Liverpool um, at the end of the struggle in the 80s. Um, I'm a member of Left Unity, um, and it just—it was Trish that made me decide to say this. Trish, we're eco-socialists. We're pro-migrant. We're anti-racist, we're feminist, we're internationalist. And um, we were, we're, you know, we're not, we're not huge. We had a big influx before the Corbyn surge and after when Corbyn came, a lot of people left and joined Labour. But, and, and, and we support the idea of, the really important idea of grassroots work in, in many different fields. Um, and left Unity wants to work cooperatively with people in, on the left, whether it's within Labour or outside of Labour. 
we think issues are really important that you know key issues we've just got to work together nobody here never mind those of us who joined the labor party in the 70s none of us have experience of what's going on today what's going on today is new and different it's still a fight against capitalism but it's a different fight against capitalism and it's a we have we have a deadline like no other you know if we the the climate crisis can see the end of making the climate fit for human life the planet will survive itself it's humans that won't survive on the planet um i think it's feasible for us to have campaigns that are run across labor and and the left organizations outside of labor and um, we will have political differences i mean you know i stood against labor when the uh, le when labor had um, in the general election when labor was running the anti you know the anti migrant mug um, and the and what didn't want to be the party of people on benefits and and, and all the rest of it um, and it's really important that we do you know there are people who will stand and say what's necessary in elections and outside of elections we need to be able to make the point but i live in um in liverpool and within liverpool there are labor party branches which are superb i will i am not criticizing them i've got differences with them on some issues as to way they handle the migrants issue um in the uh over brexit i think they ignored the needs and the um the danger in which they were putting EU migrant workers, and I think that they underplayed the response to Windrush. Um, but nevertheless, their involvement in making sure that food gets into people's mouths during this pandemic has been exemplary. And the way they've done it has been exemplary. And if you're in a Labour Party like that, you'd be stupid to leave. But you'd be stupid to stay without close links to organized opposition either in the labor party or across the left and i would say that one of the things that we you know left unity is is talking about is saying look we're facing mass unemployment at the end of this um at the end of this pandemic we want a million council houses passive council houses which means they don't need heating they can be built they can be built and they can be built here creating work for when we built six thousand council houses in liverpool more than anybody else has built since combined all the councils since in our precious three years we built six thousand council houses that created something like ten thousand jobs and a real rhythm of development in addition to the 10,000 new houses that we should be building, we should be campaigning for the renovation of a million a million houses, a million older houses that need that um, insulation to make sure that they do not waste carbon. We need to have green jobs and be demanding green jobs and to be looking seriously at the issues of the, um, of the food chain. But we also have to be fundamentally internationalist. In this pandemic, the issue of supply chains is massive. And I, you know, Ellesmere Port is where I stood in, the, in that election. And um, although I'm living in Liverpool at the moment, my home is, is in Ellesmere Port. And Ellesmere Port has a huge car factory. It has a huge oil refinery. It has lots of heavy industry. L um, component after component after component comes in there from across the world but massively from china those components are vital and there are going to be major disruptions of that because of the pandemic we can't afford to ignore the chinese working class we can't afford to ignore the german the french the italian all the working classes that we, we we're, we're so tightly interlinked with and we can't afford to ignore 60 million people who are on the on the move because of wars and pandemics in 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 the world so left unity more than happy to work with everyone excellent discussion thank you very much and um i hope this kind of discussion continues
thank you very much, Felicity. The next speaker is John Ryman. Um, John, John, speaking to us from California. Welcome, John. Thank you. <clears throat> well, first of all, I wish we could be having a similar debate in the United States about whether to stay in or work or leave uh, a mass working class party here. But as you all know, we've never had such a party in the United States. Um, but it seems to me from what I'm hearing, listening, so to speak, from the outside, that the main differences are ones more of emphasis than anything else. Um, and of course, also, it seems to me that it's mostly a matter of gauging where the mood and the consciousness are at. So, but since I'm speaking from the outside, I can't really comment on the issues which you comrades are discussing, although I've found the discussion extremely interesting and, and useful. But uh, recognizing that the United States is not Great Britain, and also that the unions are not the same as a, a political party, but still there are some similarities. And I'd like to comment from, from that point of view. Now, I was the uh, recording secretary in my local of the Carpenters Union, and I was uh, active in my union for 30 years. Um, and we've had in the United States a 75 year war conducted on the part of the union leadership <clears throat> against all the best traditions of the labor movement in the United States and against the very idea of working class solidarity, which means class consciousness. And such a war isn't conducted just in the, e in the atmosphere, it's conducted against those members, those workers who carry those traditions and those ideas and attempt to isolate, uh, to ostracize, uh, and to ostracize them and at times even to drive them out of the industry or out of and or out of the union and the result has been that there's been a massive alienation of the membership um, towards their unions which are just completely missing in action for the members in terms of their daily lives and work aside from the building trades for particular reasons uh, particular to the building trades you go to most workers and in and, and unions, just the average rank and file worker, at least in my area, they don't even know the name of their union. That's how absent the unions are uh, from, their, from their lives. Um, and um, so some, and, and if you go to the union meetings, I don't know to what extent it's changed. I was expelled from my union and I'll get to that in a minute. But at least up until the time, and up until recently at least, when you go to the union meetings, those unions that still have meetings, almost nobody would come except for the bureaucrats and, and a few retirees and the wannabe bureaucrats. And so some on the left have adapted to this by orienting towards that layer of the union membership, tiny as it is, um, and, and others, have, uh, have concluded from this that therefore the unions are dead and we should have, don't even bother uh, relating to them in any way. And uh, my experience, I was expelled from the union in, uh, due to uh, uh, my role in a mass wildcat strike in 1999. And you couldn't have a better example of rank and file workers acting outside of and in fact against their traditional organization. But at the same time, the attendance at the local union meetings, at least in my local, the attendance went up 10 times over in that strike. So I think you see like these contradictory processes developing at the same time. Now, I would just like to comment, um, you're going to see, or you may see it here on the West Coast, the Longshoremen's Union, that's the Dockers Union, is calling for a big protest on uh, next Friday in support of Black Lives Matter. I think you'll get 10, 15, 20,000 people, and it's gonna be the entire West Coast. In fact, it might be the East Coast and the Gulf Coast also, which would be a first. And you will see tens of thousands of workers 
in coming to those protests, in addition to the Black Lives Matter and the youth. But the intent of the union leadership is to have basically another one and done. They'll have this big protest, pretend that they've done something, and that not, not to uh, uh, change anything as far as the union leadership being completely missing in action on the streets. Whether they'll be able to carry through on that intent is a different question. Um, but in any case, um, what I wonder, I think that a workers party in the United States will develop through this uh, kind of inchoate, somewhat anarchic, but extremely militant mass movement in the streets. And it, that such a movement starting to come together. And I wonder if a regeneration of the Labour Party, uh, to a certain extent, could not develop uh, through the same process. Um, now, um, as far as the, there was a mention of the scale of the defeat of the left in Britain, and you're seeing something similar in the United States. I mentioned the war against uh, class consciousness on the part of the union bureaucracy. That also had an effect as far as creating a huge distancing of the revolutionary socialist left from the working class in the United States. Of course, there were other factors involved also, um, but that went hand in hand with a real uh, degeneration of the left. For instance, many of them today are unable to distinguish the process of counter-revolution from uh, uh, a struggle against, uh, against imperialism. Um, so just uh, uh, in conclusion, I agree with what Trish said about, you know, that we must not ignore the question of the environment. And I think that the issue of COVID-19 will return with a vengeance to the forefront um, in, in our consciousness. And we must remember that that issue is first and foremost an issue based on number one, food supply, and number two, an environmental issue. Um, finally, I think that, uh, we also must not underestimate the dangers of reaction. And I think a lot of that reaction stems from the enormous confusion uh, uh, that has developed due to what uh, the Guardian newspaper uh, said in an article a couple of years ago about the demise of the nation state. And that makes the issue of internationalism and international working class solidarity, not just in words, but in action, that makes it all the more important. Thank you very much, John. Um, I, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's been an excellent discussion. Um, and I'm now, we're running a little bit over time, but I, I, I can tell from people's faces that there's a great, been a great engagement in this meeting and, and really some brilliant contributions making us all think. I'm going to call on Roger to uh, wind up this discussion and let me also draw your attention to the fact that the pamphlet we're talking about uh, the the link to it has been put up on the chat list if anyone um is is anxious to get hold of a copy at the end of the uh, at the end of the discussion so roger it's over to you right thank you very much comrade i quite agree it's been uh, uh, an absolutely brilliant uh, discussion and uh, all, all the comrades who've spoken have actually given something new for us to uh, to consider. Uh, look, I can't answer all the points. I just want to make one or two. First of all, um, you know, comrades, if we're going to have a, a, a little comparison of when we joined, I actually joined the Labour Party in 1960. Um, uh, I, I know that would be impossible for you to uh, believe, but, you know, that is the case. I was uh, rather young at the time um, and um, I came from a very solid Labour family. Um, my dad was, um, was a, a, a left Labour MP and he, was, uh, he himself was expelled from the Parliamentary Labour Party on two occasions. And uh, I remember even, you know, I mean, I actually remember the, uh, the debate about Cross 4 when Gate School tried to remove it and so on. And I'm talking, I, I was not a member, of course, for, uh, of the Labour Party during the entire new Labour period, because, and I uh, considered that it wasn't even a workers' party at that time. And, um, and 
I rejoined only with the um, only in order to um, vote for Corbyn in in uh, 2015. And by the way, a, a number of comrades here have been um, suspended or expelled from the party. I was uh, I think I was one of the first to be suspended um, in uh, in 2016, and I managed to um, I, I had a I had a, a, a most uh, enjoyable um, confrontation with um, with somebody hired to give me a telephone interrogation and turned the tables, I would say, on the interrogator, and they actually at that time did um, reverse my suspension. I'm uh, having written this pamphlet. I, I, uh, I, I well, like all the comrades here, I'm not expelled. I'm not afraid of uh, of suspension or expulsion from the party. I think it's uh, inevitable they'll have a go, uh, now, especially now that I've written this pamphlet. And um, I, um, uh, that's, that's just part of the whole process. It's part of what we're going through. But I'm not going to go quiet, quietly though. I will fight back and I will fight with everything I've got. And, um, and, I, and the purpose of that fight is not, with, uh, not because I'm desperate about whether I win or lose it, but because in the process of that fight, we win support, so we explain the issues, and we uh, move towards what's what's um, what's inevitably happening. Now, I must um, remind comrades: I'm not. I explicitly did not say. I'm just saying you've got to stay and fight because that that gives no perspective. Fight for what or with what results? And I quite agree um, on the whole on all the comrades of what I said. I wasn't trying to, and I don't think anybody who who uh, reads my pamphlet will suspect. <laughs> in any way, I'm trying to prettify the uh, the picture of the Labour Party in um, uh, you know before the new Labour period, but it was it was led by cowards and traitors, and uh, that was the problem. That, that was the whole nature of the Labour Party. That the uh, the, the rank and file was uh, was um, the rank and file were completely betrayed by the uh, by the leadership of the Labour Party again and again and again. But the point is, our comrades seriously saying, those comrades who've, um, who've um, disputed my point, are they saying that there's no difference between the Labour Party before New Labour took over and not? Because the ruling class certainly saw the difference. The ruling class, their attitude to the Labour Party, despite the fact that they knew that they were cowards and traitors and they wouldn't carry through uh, uh, um, a, a, poli a socialist policy, they wouldn't carry through a revolution. They knew that very well, but they were terrified. They were always preparing their force. They were always using all their tricks. They were always using all, all the um, propaganda powers they have and all the, um, all the elements of the security state and uh, even open threats from the military and everything they were doing in order um, in order to ensure that things didn't get out of hand uh, with a, with the Labour government. That was not the case from 1994 onwards until the Corbyn period, and uh, uh, particularly until the until they'd uh, until New Labour had outlived its usefulness by the time of the 2008 uh, crash. But the um, the the uh, at the time in the New Labour period, the period of Blair. Labour was the preferred political instrument of the ruling class in this country. The, all the money was going, the, the, the funding, the, the Tory party for the first time in its history was starved of funds. The funding from big business was pouring into Labour Party, new Labour coffers. That was the case. And, there is, and what we're doing, seeing now is, um, is still the fact that there are two parties there. There's the, there's the uh, party of the rank and file, which, uh, which is aspiring towards a new, a new society. And there's the, um, there's the creatures, the monstrous creatures of, um, of um, the leftovers, if you like, the, um, the um, droppings of new labor who still infest the parliamentary party and infest the, the party machine. And we see that very clearly. So what is coming? The point is that I have not said, 
And I, I went out of my way to say, it's not a question of staying up fighting. It's not a question of just, uh, a, you know, dutifully turning up once a month to the World Party meetings or the GMCs and just uh, moving resolutions and passing them. Although that has its place as well. It's a question of that there are, that we have to, you know, I, I'm, I'm afraid that nobody has taken up the point about the, what is the perspective? We're not just talking about whether we like or don't like what's going on in the, uh, in, in the um, in the Labour Party, it's a question of what is the perspective, what is actually happening. Uh, the, the Labour Party has been on the verge of a split for 20 years or 25 years, uh, particularly uh, the last 10 years. But it hasn't come to fruition, largely as the comrades have said, because of the pusillanimity of the left, because of the fact that um, when we had the chance, when Corbyn was in the leadership, we could not managed to, uh, to uh, uh, achieve the mandatory reselection of the MPs. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't uh, uh, democratise the, uh, the National Executive Committee. We couldn't, we couldn't uh, take control of the party even when we had the leadership. The leader, the leader himself was a hostage of these vile criminals in the party machine and in the parliamentary Labour Party. So the point is that we've been on, it's been on the verge of a split at this time, but now, particularly now, with the, with the sweep of the revolution, which we see taking place around us, we are, as comrades have, have, have said and uh, agreed, that we're in a completely new period now. So we're not saying, um, we're not saying go back to the war. The, the, you know, who, who knows what's going to be left in the storms in the hurricanes that are coming, in the floods that are coming in society, do you think that it's going to be a question of just attending Labour Party, GMCs and passing resolutions and so on? Of course not. I mean, it's, there's going to be convulsions. Convulsions. I mean, and I would say, by the way, I mean, most of the comrades here who are in the Labour Party, they, they know very well that there are two Labour Parties. They see it there. Trish spoke. Trish is in my Labour Party, West Ham Labour Party. She's quite right. That there are vile and horrible creatures there who are Tories or worse than Tories. But, you, you know, Trish, why not say the other side of it? That we have also a really powerful and really active and energetic left who, uh, who are on the streets, even through the lockdown, they're on the streets and campaigning. Uh, that we, that, you know, we, in fact, that we, um, the left still controls the, the, all, all the major positions in the West Ham constituency Labour Party. Now, there's no way, Trish, I'm sure you'll agree with me, there's no way that we, in the, uh, on the, the left of the West Ham Labour, Labour Party, are going to remain in the same party as, I won't, I won't name their names, but you know who I mean, as some of the vile, disgusting creatures that we also have in the Labour Party, and particularly on the council, on the, uh, on the Labour Council there. So the point is, we, there's no way that we're going to stay in the same in the same party. But how will that come about? It's not. It's no use just saying, "Well, uh, you know, well, I've had enough. I'm leaving." That is. That's all right. That's a quite understandable personal personal reaction. But we're, you know, we're in politics. We have to think of of uh, you know, particularly as Marxists, we have to we have to have some kind of perspective on how things are actually. Uh, going to work out. So there's got to be, as I say, let's let's put it again in that phrase. We don't. We're not going to drop out. We've got to march out. It's got to come to to um, to a split and a new beginning. And that's going to be something we're all going to participate. The, the differences we discussed here today, they're very temporary, tactical differences. And within maybe six months or or or, um, or a year, perhaps they'll already be in the archives as a kind of completely um, bygone uh, discussion. The point is that we, um, the, the point is that there's a mass, there's a mass movement of people who are looking for a leadership. There are the half a million people who join the Labour Party uh, in order to support Corbyn. Where are they going to go? If they just dissipate and just go home and, uh, and just wander off in this or that direction, then all that momentum is going to be lost, um, to use an, a word which is becoming a little bit um, uh, dicey now. But all, the, all that, all that uh, impetus will be, will be lost. We have, to make, we have to have some perspective that we can create a mass party out of all those people who've been betrayed and disappointed in the Labour Party in the last uh, period.
I thank comrades very, very much for, for listening to me and for the discussion and for the excellent points that have come out. I hope we continue this discussion. I hope if you haven't read my pamphlet, you will, uh, you will read it. And I hope that you'll also um, produce material of your own to develop it and to improve it, and if necessary, to dispute it.